Good day. This is a recorded lecture for Chapter 3. And this lecture is designed to go with Week 2 in the course. Chapter 3 opens with a case study on the Chesapeake Bay. The Chesapeake Bay's watershed is vast and is a complex system with over 11,000 miles of tidal shoreline in six states and a population of 20 million people. That's quite a bit larger than our own San Francisco Bay. On the slide, you can see the positions of Chesapeake Bay and San Francisco Bay marked here. And I've included the figure from the case study and also a similar figure, the closest one I could find, looking at San Francisco Bay. For Chesapeake Bay, approximately 100,000 streams and rivers drain into the bay. These streams carry runoff from forests, farmlands, cities, and suburbs from as far away as New York. Our San Francisco Bay is not as large, but it is similar in its complexity. The introduction to the chapter talks about a case study for the Chesapeake Bay, and a similar one was done for San Francisco Bay. Both are examples of the difficulty of managing large, complex systems, which we talked about in Chapter 2. In Chesapeake Bay, progress is making a better understanding materialize of issues that affect the health of Chesapeake Bay. The integrated functioning of the uplands and waterways, the interdependence of the diverse human commu communities and economies that depend on Chesapeake Bay, and the pathways of nitrogen and phosphorus through the ecosystem. And the reason why the case study was chosen is that the pathways of nitrogen and phosphorus, phosphorus are kind of the example that closely relates to what we're going to talk about in this chapter. Nitrogen and phosphorus are very important to the organization of the major biomolecules that support life in the first place. So we'll talk about that. But the nitrogen and phosphorus is a source of pollution in some of these base systems are also a factor in their degradation and looking at it the other way in their restoration. Chesapeake Bay could become the largest and perhaps the most broadly beneficial ecosystem restoration that's ever been attempted in the United States. But San Francisco is engaged in its own program through an organization called CalFed, which is a joint federal and state agency through a program entitled Ecosystem Restoration Program. This program is working to improve the ecological health of the Bay Delta watershed, which drains into the bay. And they're working on restoring and protecting habitats, looking at ecosystem functions to try to gain the same understanding that they're getting for Chesapeake Bay and also looking at native species. The CalFed program, although working maybe on a smaller area than Chesapeake Bay, is a collaboration of, of 25 state and federal agencies. Its mission is to improve California's water supply and the ecological health of the San Francisco Bay and the Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta. So in this chapter, we're going to examine the basics of matter and energy and ecosystems and how these move through systems and why they are important. Understanding these basic ideas will help you explain the functioning of many different types of systems, including Chesapeake Bay, the San Francisco Bay, or a more localized ecosystem. This chapter includes the following key concepts. In short order, this chapter paces through the basics of the chemistry of life, the elements or atoms, molecules, and the carbon-based 
biomolecules. Once you get to this point, you have the building blocks for living organisms. But living things need energy, so how living organisms obtain, obtain energy for life is the next part of this discussion in the chapter. Going beyond that, life does not happen unless you have a biosphere capable of supporting it in the first place. With a biosphere, living things can only exist in a functioning ecosystem. Finally, if you have all of these in place, life emerges and gets interesting through interacting in biological communities. <clears throat> Connecting to the case study, nutrient cycling is one of the most important functions of ecosystems. Another key inner is energy flow. The case studies of estuaries that we just talked about shows how important nutrients are to how healthy or unhealthy ecosystems can be. These are some important concepts for you to understand as you go through the chapter. So take a look at these terms, and as you read the chapter, you want to understand their definitions. We begin with some basics about chemistry, particularly the chemistry of life. If you're familiar with basic chemistry, you may want to skip over this next series of slides. What we're going to go to quite rapidly is understanding carbon as a basis of the biomolecules that form the architecture of what we know and understand as life. Each element has a characteristic number of protons per atom. This is called the atomic number. We're going to fo focus on carbon since it's one of the most important ingredients for life forms. So the atomic number of carbon is 6. With 6 protons, the number of electrons influences the bonding properties of atoms. Each element also has a characteristic atomic mass, which is the sum of protons and neutrons. <coughs> Each has a mass of about 1, so the mass of a carbon atom would be about 12. Sometimes the number of neutrons can vary, so forms of an element can have a different atomic mass, and these are called isotope, isotopes. We won't spend much time on isotopes, but isotopes are important. We'll come back to them later because they provide a tool, in some cases, to study various kinds of environmental issues, for example, climate change. <clears throat> Carbon is central to many of life's molecules. So as we showed in the previous slide, and this is a little bit more information about carbon, it has six protons and six electrons. It has two shells orbiting the nucleus. Because the outer shell has eight electron positions, carbon has four electrons on the outer shell and four potential positions for bonding with other elements. We call that four valence positions. Giving another example, oxygen has two valence positions. Hydrogen has one valence position. The positions available for sharing electrons affects the properties of the element and what type of compounds it will form. Carbon, with its four valence positions, or ability to share four electrons with other elements, is particularly versatile. This is why carbon is essential to life as we know it. Now this slide shows the carbon atom, the total number of electrons, which is six, how they're positioned in those uh, solid dots on the carbon atom. And with four positions available for sharing in the green open circles there, that's how carbon can react with other compounds. The way to think about this simply, and I know if some of you are chemists, we're grossly simplifying things, is that carbon has four sort of uh, sticks 
that can, it can use to attach to other atoms. So I've drawn what we call a stick, um, a stick model or a molecular structure model of the compound methane. So you can see carbon ha can share with four hydrogen atoms in this case to form the uh, gas methane. <clears throat> atoms join to form compounds or substances composed of different kinds of atoms. Take a look at these different types of uh, molecules. A pair or a group of atoms that can exist as a single unit is known as a molecule. So these are important molecules for environmental science. The may all compounds or all substances composed of one or more atoms are called molecules. If a substance is formed with two different types of elements, we call that a compound. So that's the difference between a compound and molecule. There are three gases on the top row that are actually molecules and not compounds because they're formed with the same element, hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, and nitrogen gas. The types of, co the types of molecules that these substances shown here form are done by sharing one electron between two different elements. This type of bond is called a covalent bond. Generally, it is a very strong bond. It takes energy to break a bond, and forming a bond releases energy. Atoms can share one, two, or three bonds. Hydrogen gas on the top row of this diagram shares one electron between two atoms. As I mentioned earlier, hydrogen has a position of one, or a valence position of one, so it wants to share an electron with one other atom that can share one. Therefore, you get hydrogen gas or two atoms sharing one electron to form this covalent bond. Oxygen, as shown in this diagram, shares two covalent bonds. So we call that, shares two electrons. So that's a double covalent bond. Nitrogen actually shares three. So that's a triple covalent bond. You can represent compounds by using the symbol for the element and these long dashes, as I mentioned in the previous slide, and I've shown here. So now you can see at the very bottom of this slide sort of a more uh, what we call space filling model of the methane mo molecule sharing one electron with four hydrogen atoms and how we could represent that with the symbol for the element and dashes to show bonds. If you are unfamiliar with this basic chemistry, then you should consider reading the chapter in more detail. So now that we've talked about um, covalent bonding, we want to quickly move to another concept where unequal electron sharing in, co in covalent bonding creates polar molecules. This is important because water is a polar molecule. So the water has what we call unequal electron sharing. Water forms two covalent bonds with two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. Because of the size of the two elements of the molecule, one side of the molecule is more positively charged than the other side. So the shared electrons, which are negatively charged, spend more time near the oxygen. They sort of get pulled to that larger element. 
So the other term for this is called a polar covalent bond. So the water molecule, the oxygen atom, has a slight negative charge, and the hydrogens have a slight positive charge. So molecules with this unequal distribution of charges are called polar molecules. Polarity is a really important property of water. Oxygen attracts the shared electrons more strongly than hydrogen. So a water molecule tends to be slightly more negative at the oxygen side compared to the hydrogen side. Although the charges overall are balanced, the way to think about this is that the charges are somewhat asymmetrical. So let's go to the next slide. This is an expanded diagram of the water molecule. And you can see, because of the size differential, more of the electrons are going to be attracted to the oxygen molecule. So the oxygen end of this, or the top shown in this diagram, is going to be negative compared to the bottom end. One way to, to picture this is to compare the water molecule to the methane molecule. You see the methane molecule looks sort of balanced compared to the water molecule. It's almost as if the water molecule is kind of topsy-turvy a little bit, or somewhat asymmetrical. <laughs> because of polarity, hydrogen will share attractions with the negative side of other polar molecules. Because the positively charged region of the water molecule is always positive, these weak attractions are called hydrogen bonds. So let's look at the next slide to kind of show this idea. <clears throat> so this is what water sort of does in liquid form. The negative end of the molecule, or the oxygen end, will sort of orient towards the positive, positive end, or the hydrogen end. This is very important, this polarity property, because life chemistry takes place in water because of this ability of water to do this. <coughs> One reason that um, we search for life water on other planets, such as Mars, is because wherever there's water, there seems to be life. So we're moving rapidly through these basic uh, chemi chemistry concepts. So do read your chapter um, so that you kind of have a grasp of it. Now I'm going to talk about acids and bases. The chemistry of life is sensitive to acidic and basic conditions. Because of the property of water and this polarity, it's, it's somewhat dynamic. I mean, you can think of liquid water as sort of a dynamic thing. So a few water molecules break apart into ions. So the hydrogen sort of pops off the water molecule and becomes a hydrogen ion. And what's left is an oxygen and a hydron oxygen and a hydrogen, and that sort of is left dissociated, and that's negative. <clears throat> so both of these hydrogen ions and these hydroxide ions are extremely reactive. So a balance between the two is critical for chemical processes to occur in living organisms. So the way I like to think about this, again, visually, I'd mention the water molecule and how it looks somewhat asymmetrical. So again, these are molecular space filling models of, two, of an acid and a base. So let's look at the acid first. That's hydrogen chlor hydrochloric acid. Can you almost see there that, that that hydrogen, when it's in water, wants to just kind of pop off of there? That's kind of the way I've, I like to understand it for um, those of us who are 
uh, not um, as acquainted with chemistry. By the same token, a base, you can see that there's a sodium atom noted there in purple and a hydroxide group. So that hydroxide group sort of wants to pop off of there when it's in water. So what happens is when you have an acid, the acid contributes more hydrogen ions into the solution. When you have a base, it contributes more hydroxide ions into the solution. So I hope that helps. So when we talk about pH, pH is a scale that measures the degree of acidity or basicity. So this pH scale shows that the smaller the number, the more concentrated the acid is, the more acidic a solution is. If you look at the upper end of the scale, the higher number there is, the more basic, the more uh, basicity there is, that is, the bases are higher. So in between, it's neutral. So pure distilled water is neutral. There will be an equal number of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions that you can uh, sort of measure in the solution. But if the solution, by adding an acid or adding a base, uh, changes on either side of the scale, there are more hydrogen ions relative to hydroxide ions, making it an acid, or vice versa with the base. So now let's go back to carbon. Life's molecular diversity is based on the properties of carbon. Carbon's ability to bond in four directions is called tetravalence. This is one facet of carbon's versatility that makes large complex molecules possible. One of the great advantages of life based on carbon is its ability to form up to four bonds, permitting this assembly of diverse components and branching configurations. What you can think about is that carbon is like an erector set. It allows large molecules to be made that form living organisms. So let's take a look at the four important molecules for life. So I've again put our little um, diagram of the methane molecule. But if you look at any one of those hydrogens, you could take that off and you could put some other element there, for example, carbon. So that's how carbon becomes very versatile. If you look at number A above, you can see how multiple carbons can be attached through covalent bonding together. And then you can balance out the um, molecule with these other types of uh, elements. So let's look at this figure for a little bit. <clears throat> it shows how carbon skeletons form the four major groups of biologically important molecules. The four major groups of biologically important organic molecules are based on repeating subunits of these carbon-based structures. So the basic structures are, if you look at A, butyric acid, which is a building block of lipids or fats that are important in biology. And just to contrast that with a, um, a hydrocarbon, hydrocarbons, this is propane. So propane is slightly more complex than methane. But hydrocarbons, of course, are quite important in, for some of our fuel sources. In B here, we show a simple carbohydrate. So you can see how carbon is connected. Um, there's six carbons shown here, but you see how it can form a ring in this configuration. So glucose is sort of the energy molecule 
for living things. And you can actually attach many of these units together to form more complex uh, rings of glucose, and we call those carbohydrates. C is a protein. This is a simple amino acid. You can also hook multiple amino acids together and form proteins. So proteins are the basis of many of our structural parts of our cells and also for enzymes that complete our metabolic reactions. Note in this picture that we've added nitrogen as when we get to an, a simple amino acid. So now you can see sort of the role that nitrogen, why nitrogen is an important nutrient because it's a component of all proteins. Finally, we're going to look at a nucleotide. This is a the building blocks a uh, building block that's used for nucleic acids, and nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. You can see that phosphorus is present in this uh, molecule along with nitrogen. So there's where our phosphorus and nitrogen come from. You can hook multiple nu nucleotides together to form DNA. So jumping quickly to DNA, this is, this is a nucleic acid, deoxyribonucleic acid is its full name, or DNA. This figure shows a composite molecular model of DNA. The lower part shows the individual atoms, while the upper part has been simplified to so, show what um, you probably have heard about is the strands of the double helix. Note that hydrogen bonds hold the nucleotides together. A complete DNA, DNA molecule contains millions of nucleotides and carries genetic information for many specific inheritable traits. The nucleotide is the basic building block of DNA. DNA in cells controls what proteins are made. Proteins in turn form the structural parts of cells and also the enzymes that I just mentioned. The other important part to note is that there is a bonding sequence. The actual names for the nucleotides are not all that important. We're just going to uh, start with C, T, A, and G for now. You can see that G and C forms a hydrogen bond, always pairs with its G and C. So G and C or G, C are the same. A always bonds with T. So the important uh, quick explanation of, the, of DNA is that there are three nucleotides, but shown with these three arrow, arrows, forms a codon, which equals one amino acid in a, in a protein. So DNA basically transcribes active genes into an interim product called RNA, also a nucleo nucleic acid, which in turn instructs the cells to make specific sequences of amino acids into a specific protein. So like I said, we're going quite rapidly through these basics. Read your chapter um, so that you kind of have a, a grasp of this information. So now we're going to jump up, jump up to cells. Cells are the structural and functional units of life. And the building blocks of all cells include nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, lipids which include fats, and carbohydrates, the four basic types of biomolecules that we just talked about. All living organisms are composed of cells which are minute compartments within which all processes of life are carried out. Microscopic organisms such as bacteria, some algae, and protozoa, protozoa are composed of single cells. 
Higher organisms have many cells. So your body, for instance, is composed of several trillion cells of about 200 distinctive types. Each cell is surrounded by a thin membrane composed of lipids, that biological molecule we just talked about, and protein, that other biological molecule we just talked about, that receives information about the exterior world and regulates the flow of materials between cell, the cell and its environment. Inside a cell is divided into tiny organelles that provide all the machinery for life. There are many theories of how biological molecules formed into life, and how this actually happened is still a mystery. We also recognize two distinct groups of cells, prokaryotic cells. These are simple and small cells. Bacteria, for example, are prokaryotic cells. Eukaryotic cells possess the organelles that I just mentioned. And each organelle is separated by membranes within the actual plasma membrane of the cell itself. Plants, animals, and fungi are all eukaryotic cells. So most of the multicellular life forms that you recognize are eukaryotic. This is a slide contrasting the size and complexity of prokaryotic cells with eukaryotic cells. This is actually a micrograph of a cell, so you can readily see the nucleus where the DNA is contained. And then you can see a number of other bodies here that are the organelles. So animals and plants are both, eukary are both have eukaryotic cells. So plant tissues are formed from individual cells. The cell components, or the organelles in these cells, include a cellulosic cell wall, a nucleus, a large empty vacuole, and several chloroplasts. So you can see what some of the functions of the cell are here. So now that we've gotten through the basics of the chemistry of life and cells, we can start looking at living organisms and their environments. So living organisms interact with their environments by exchanging matter and energy. The importance of plants and other photosynthetic organisms to ecosystem dynamics can't be overstated. As I pointed out on one of the first slides, you can have the ingredients for building life cells and multicellular organisms, but it's the ecosystem that supports the process of living. This is a relevant point as we embark on the study of our role in ecosystems, either preserving them, enhancing them, or degradating them. An ecosystem includes living and non-living comp components. At some level, life has to convert the non-living substances to living ones. This is how we distinguish an ecosystem from a biotic community. An ecosystem is the interaction between abiotic or non-living parts of the environment with the living or biotic parts. All organisms require energy. The base and set point of all ecosystems is the producers, usually plants, but there are others, other life forms that in other life forms, too, that convert sunlight energy to organic molecules, or glucose, which is the way all other organisms harvest energy. Consumers then eat plants, or they eat other consumers. <coughs> to be successful, an ecosystem must provide two main processes to all living things recycling of chemicals or the elements necessary for life, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and others, and a source of energy that life can harvest and use for 
metabolic processes. This is a simple diagram, a little different from your book, that shows how an ecosystem functions. <coughs> a lot of it has to do with the fact that the Earth is able to cycle energy and nutrients that other planets cannot do. Life cannot exist and highly organized life has to interact with the physical environment and, t and obtain these energy and nutrients. How well the cycling functions or does not function has implications for organism, organisms. Particularly re relevant to climate change in most terrestrial ecosystems, the source of energy is sunlight. Plants capture sunlight energy and convert it to chemical energy. To do this, they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they convert it to plant biomass. That's why plants are called the producers. All other organisms consume plants or other animals that, it, that in turn consume plants to get their source of chemical energy. The energy input, though, has to be constant, and that comes from sunlight for the most part. Waste heat is generated in the process. When plants or animals die, their biomass has to be recycled in order to provide the key elements mostly nitrogen and phosphorus, also carbon, and others. So this recycling of elements is also important. So decomposers are a key part of the cycling of chemical nutrients. So let's look at how plants actually are able to function as producers. Before we do that, we have to look at energy. Energy occur occurs in different types and qualities. So energy is a finite quantity. It can neither be created nor destroyed, but it can be changed. Energy is divided into two types for our purposes. Kinetic energy, or the energy of work or motion, and potential energy, or stored energy. So chemical energy, such as that type of energy stored in glucose is stored energy in food or in fuels. The challenge for living organisms is how to capture energy in a way that it can be used. There are also organisms that can use other forms of chemical energy and convert it to living biomass. The microbes that inhabit the deep ocean vents, for example, don't use sunlight. They use other forms of energy. But how most life depends on the ability of plants, either aquatic or terrestrial, to convert light energy from the sun to the chemical energy in biomass. The other challenge is to capture this energy in a controlled way so it can be used by cells. The reactions of photosynthesis and cellular respiration are therefore critical to how life can process energy. So let's start with plants. Plants harvest visible radiation or light to supply the energy for the chemical reactions to form glucose. Glucose is the molecule used for all other metabolic needs of living things. Plants are quite clever about they, how they do this. So plants contain chlorophyll, and they contain chlorophyll of different types, so they can absorb different wavelengths. Chlorophyll is a type of pigment, and it's pigments that actually capture the solar energy. Pigments in chloroplasts are responsible for absorbing photons, that is the package of solar energy, and causing the release of, of electrons. The electrons jump to a higher energy level. We call that the excited state. And then when they drop back down, they release their excess energy that's in, then captured into chemical bonds. Let's look at the light spectrum for a minute. Figure 310 in your book presents the electromagnetic spectrum. Our eyes are sensitive to light wavelengths, which make up about 
half of the energy that reaches the Earth's surfaces, Earth's surface. So look at the area under the curve. So the most of the light that we can see is the most abundant type of light. Photosynthesizing plants also use this most abundant source of energy. The Earth actually re re emits lower energy or longer wavelengths, mainly in the infrared part of the spectrum. So this is an interesting graph. Life itself sort of takes advantage of the most type of abundant energy. By the way, the atmosphere protects the Earth from the most dangerous ra radiation, the short wavelengths that you see going to the left of this diagram. They're in smaller amounts, but it's the ozone layer, and we'll get to that problem, that also um, protects us from the more destructive types of uh, light wavelengths. Of the light wavelengths, photosynthesis uses mainly red and blue light. Most plants reflect green wavelengths because it's not used, so that is the color that they appear to us. Half the, of the energy plants absorb is used in evaporating water. In the end, only about 1 to 2 percent of the sunlight falling on plants is actually available to photos, for photosynthesis. This small percentage represents the energy base for all life in the biosphere. One of the promises of solar energy is the technology to use more of this abundant resource that is available to us from the sun. The process by which plants accomplish this is called photosynthesis. Photosynthesis occurs in tiny organelles called chloroplasts that reside within the plant cell. You can go back to the figure of the plant cell and take a look at those specific organelles. The most important key to this process is chlorophyll. It's a green molecule that absorbs light energy and uses the energy to create high energy chemical compounds that serve as the fuel for all subsequent cell cellular metabolism. Chlorophyll doesn't do this job alone. It is assisted by a large group of other molecules such as lipids, sugars, proteins, and nucleotides. Together these components carry it out a two interconnected cyclic sets of reactions called the light reactions and the light independent reactions or Calvin cycle. The chemistry of this is quite complex and way beyond the course the scope of this course. The way to understand photosynthesis is that light energy is used to step up enough energy using this excitation of, in, of electrons to form chemical bonds in high energy molecules. The, this high energy molecule is the energy currency of living cells, or ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. There you go, there's some phosphorus in that molecule. Photosynthesis begins with a series of light dependent reactions. These use solar energy directly to split water molecules into oxygen, which is then released to the atmosphere, and hydrogen. This is the source of all the oxygen in the atmosphere on which all animals, including ourselves, depend for life. Separating the hydrogen atom from its, electron, its electrons produces hydrogen ions and an electron, both of which used to form mobile high energy molecules, or the ATP we just talked about. The light independent reactions then use the energy in the ATP molecules to assemble glucose. So the carbon is extracted from the atmosphere, the hydrogen is split off from the water, and then the oxygen from the carbon dioxide actually is used to form the organic molecule glucose. So I think that's enough about the chemistry of photosynthesis.
This is the reaction of the photosynthesis shown in a balanced chemical equation. So six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules, with the input of light energy to form chemical bonds. We talked about how it takes energy to form bonds, produces glucose, and then the release of oxygen gas. I will point out that some organisms do obtain chemical energy in other ways. Chemosynthesis is the other way, other process that is used. The next question is, what does the plant do with glucose? Because glucose is an energy-rich compound, it serves as a central primary fuel for all metabolic processes of cells. The energy in its chemical bonds created by photosynthesis can be released by other enzymes and used to make other molecules, such as lipid proteins and nucleic acids or other carbohydrates that we talked about. Or it can drive kinetic processes, such as the movement of ions across membranes, transmission of mes messages, changes in cellular shape or structure, or movement of the cell in some cases. The process of releasing chemical energy is called cellular respiration. It involves splitting carbon and hydrogen atoms from the sugar molecule and recombining them with oxygen to create carbon dioxide and water plus some energy. Let's look at both reactions side by side. Cellular respiration and photosynthesis are basically mirror reactions. Cellular respiration on the bottom essentially oxidizes glucose, losing electrons to oxygen. Photosynthesis essentially oxidizes water, losing electrons to carbon dioxide to produce glucose. When we discuss Chesapeake Bay as a complex system, we're concerned about these things, the rates of photosynthesis, the abundance of either photosynthesizing algae, and the available of chemical nutrients. All these things affect the way the bay performs as a complex ecosystem. So the ability of the organisms in the bay to photosynthesize affects the higher the organisms that feed on algae or plants, such as blue crabs, oysters, and other species. All of these, these interactions contribute to how the ecosystem performs and its stability and health. It's the plants that form the basis of all ecosystems in terrestrial environments. And it's the photosynthesizing algae and, in some cases, bacteria that provide the set point for aquatic e ecosystems. So let's take a look and contrast these two pictures of a tropical rainforest and a desert. Abiotic factors, which we're now going to mention, such as temperature, day length, and moisture, affect how much photosynthesis can occur, and therefore the production of biomass. So all other organisms then become limited by this base amount of food resources. So let's go back to some definitions here. Terms like ecosystem, population, and community have particular meanings um, for biologists and environmental science, science environmental science scientists. So an ecosystem is defined as composed of a biological community and its physical environment. In other words, the biological community and the physical uh, aspects are both important. 
A biological or biotic community includes all populations living and interacting in a particular area. And then a population includes all members of a species, that is one species, living in a given area at a given time. So when we look at ecosystems and how they perform, we've talked about energy flow, we've talked about nutrient cycling. Ecosystems set themselves up into feeding relationships. Think about what you have eaten today and trace it back to its photosynthetic source. If you have eaten an egg, you can trace it back to a chicken, which probably ate corn. This is an example of a food chain, a linked feeding series. Now think about a more complex food chain involving you, a chicken, a corn plant, and a grasshopper. The chicken could eat grasshoppers that had eaten leaves of the corn plant. You could also eat the grasshopper direct, directly if you wanted to. Some humans actually do that. Or you could eat the corn yourself, making the shortest possible food chain. So humans actually have several options of where we fit into food chains. When we construct food chains, we talk about the producers, which we've already discussed. And then we look at the consumers. The primary consumers are the consumers that eat the producers. The secondary consumers are the consumers that eat a primary consumer that ate a producer or ate a plant. And then you can build up from there. You can go up to tertiary and quaternary consumers. Now in terrestrial systems, it pretty much stops at quaternary. That's fourth level, steps up. But in aquatic systems, they can be uh, much higher levels and more complex uh, food chains. So in ecosystems, some consumers feed on a single species, but most consumers have multiple food sources, such as humans. Similarly, some species are prey to a single kind of predator, but many species in an ecosystem are beset by many types of predators or parasites. In this way, food chains are a little bit simplified, but we really have in most ecosystems are interconnected feeding relationships, and we call that a food web. So let's just take a quick look at the hierarchy of feeding relationships that I just described to you. And don't uh, forget the decomposers and the scavengers. They feed at all levels, and they're important, again, to uh, recycle uh, nutrients back into the system. Each time an organism feeds, it becomes a link in the food chain. In an ecosystem, these food chains are interconnected when predators feed on one or more kinds of prey. And so this is what we call a food web. So this figure, figure 3.13 in your book, outlines a complicated uh, food web. And you can see the directions in which matter and energy sort of flow through this complicated food web. Depending on the system, however, these food webs will be more or less complicated. So in harsh environments, that is environments with lower production, because of these abiotic factors that we mentioned, have shorter food chains than environments in more favorable physical conditions, such as the previous slide. So this is an Arctic food chain, and so you can see it's much simpler. So this figure, 3.16, depicts how feeding relationships change in terms of the starting point, which is which are the producers, and how much energy is available for ever more complex, longer food cha chains or more complex food webs. The numbers in each bar show the percentage of the energy captured in the primary producer level that is incorporated into the biomass of each succeeding level. Detritivores and decomposers feed at every level, but 
they're shown attached to the brute producer bar because this level provides most of their energy. This is another slide that I've introduced from another text into this discussion. We talked about how the producer level is sort of the set point of ecosystems. So I want to introduce another concept here that I mentioned called primary productivity. This chart shows the net primary production of various types of ecosystems, or another way to refer to them is biomes. Note the differences between the tropical rainforest, for example, and the desert, the two pictures that we uh, contrasted just a few slides ago. I find that this chart's quite important. So photosynthesis is the base of all ecosystems. The more favorable to photosynthesis an ecosystem is, the more base there will be. So organisms that photosynthesize, mainly the green plants and the algae, are the producers. So photosynthesis is another way of looking at photosynthesis is also to call it primary productivity because it is the basis for almost all other growth in the ecosystem. The manufacture of biomass by organisms that eat plants is termed secondary productivity. A given ecosystem may have very high total productivity, but if decomposers decompose organic material as rapidly as it's formed, the net prim primary productivity might be low. It's important to consider how human activities affect primary production of ecosystems. Two of the ecosystems that are being greatly affected by human activities are the tropical rainforest and the algal beds and coral reefs. Note on this chart that these are some of the most highly productive ecosystems on the planet. Primary productivity is important because the more primary productivity there is, the more carbon is sequestered or uh, not available to the atmosphere. And of course, one of the issues with climate change is the amount of carbon that's being introduced into the atmosphere. Some of this is carbon that's been released because of declining primary productivity in some of these different ecosystems or biomes that you can see displayed here. This is a chart in your book kind of showing it another way. This is a biomass pyramid. Like energy, biomass decreases at higher and higher levels. So this is another chart showing the relationship of primary productivity to how much energy is, is available to each succeeding level. The important thing to note about this chart is to support one individual at the top carnivore level. There are 90,000 primary carnivore, carnivores feeding on 200,000 herbivores that in turn feed on a million and a half producers. So one way to think, lower your impact, and we're going to talk to the, about this as we go into succeeding chapters, is to look at ways you can feed lower on the food pyramid. So maintenance of life requires recycling between living and non-living components. And there's a number of cycles that are quite important to the study of environmental science and to the way ecosystems function. The hydrologic cycle, the carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, phosphorus cycle, and sulfur cycle. I'm going to quickly go through these cycles and just point out a couple of things. We're going to start with the water cycle. This is also called the hydrologic cycle. Water 
the exchange occurs with evaporation from the oceans and then precipitation back to the oceans. About one-tenth of the water evaporated from the oceans falls over land and is recycled through our terrestrial systems and eventually drains back to oceans and rivers. The important thing about the water cycle, and we will get to it and talk about it in more detail, is that all of our terrestrial ecosystems, including our cities and our municipalities and our civilization, depends on a fairly small amount of fresh water. This is the water cycle presented in another way, and again, we'll go back to this. But the, thing, the important thing to note here is that some of our problems, such as pollution, are involved with the water cycle. For example, if we have a landfill that, isn't, that is producing pollution, that water carries that pollution in the form of a plume into the shallow groundwater and also into our streams. The other thing to note is how we get some of our water. We now have the technology to sink wells into both the shallow groundwater and also into the deep groundwater. So one of the issues that we're going to work, deal with when we get to water resources is how fast we may be depleting some of these large reservoirs of uh, water. The carbon cycle is also an important one, particularly as we talk about climate change. The numbers on this slide indicate the approximate exchange of carbon in gigatons per year. Generally, natural exchanges are balanced. In other words, photosynthesis takes carbon out of the atmosphere, and then the produces biomass. Then plant, plants and both animals then sequester that carbon. When animals perform cellular respiration or decomposition occurs, some of that carbon goes back into the atmosphere. You know, the percentage of carbon in the atmosphere compared to other oxygen and nitrogen is quite low. So generally in a natural system, the photosynthesis balances respiration. What is causing climate change is the fact that we are actually taking sequestered carbon that has been buried underground for millions of years in the form of coal, natural gas, and oil, and we're burning that. It's not any different, really, from decomposition. So this is carbon that was not available to the atmosphere that's now being introduced back into the atmosphere. So we have a net add, and that's what's causing some of the concern over climate change. The nitrogen cycle is also important. Very early on, we talked about the composition of some of the important biological molecules and how nitrogen and phosphorus are prominently, prominently featured in those compounds. Our atmosphere is actually quite rich in nitrogen. But in order to get nitrogen into the ecosystem, it has the, the gaseous form has to be fixed into a form that it can be used by uh, plants. So we are now that and nitrogen tends to be limited in systems, although now we are being able to uh, sort of increase that amount of nitrogen higher because of our uh, mining of different or creation of different kinds types of nitrogen fertilizers. The phosphorus cycle is depicted here. Natural movement of phosphorus is, is much uh, slower or much slighter than some of the other cycles that we've looked at. Access to phosphorus in the soil is limited on, um, to 
erosion processes of phosphorus bearing rock. However, we've been able to increase the amount of that by mining these rock deposits and adding them into our um, total uh, mix of uh, phosphorus that we can make available for cropping, for example. The sulfur cycle is the last one. The sulfur, sulfur is present mainly in rocks, soil, and water. It cycles through ecosystems, and it has to be taken up by organisms in smaller amounts than nitrogen and phosphorus generally. Sulfur is an element that's used in uh, some proteins and other, other metabolic uh, compounds. Combustion of fossil, fossil fuels causes increased levels of atmospheric sulfur. This creates problems because atmospheric sulfur will then react with water and produce acid precipitation. So this concludes a really rapid introduction to a lot of different concepts in Chapter 3. I encourage you to read your chapter as well.